got a good one for you today, brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, enemies of all flavors and varieties out there, whoever you may be. I don't want to leave anybody out. don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, of course. But the uh, Lord showed me a good one here. The other morning I was looking through this book and uh, found a good one. We have the Character, Claims, and Practical Workings of Freemasonry by Charles G. Finney, 1869. Right there. Okay. On page, I don't have the overhead camera set up today, so I'm just going to have to figure out how to show this page here. See how I can do that. Page 83. Perver perverse and profane use of the Holy Bible. Okay. Now you can go down through here. I'll show you maybe a screenshot or something of this. You can go down through this thing and you can read it for yourself if you feel like it. It's a lot of the, if you don't, you know, if you break your oath and whatever else and you have all these bad things happen to you. Um, but that's not the important thing here. Uh, let's see. Page 84, we'll go there. Um, start up here. Uh, the all puissant then takes the ewer filled with perfumed ointment and anoints his head, eyes, mouth, heart, the tips, the tip of his right ear, hand, and foot, and says, You are now, my dear brother, received a member of our society. You will recollect to live up to the precepts of it, and also remember that those parts of your body which have the greatest power of assisting you in good or evil have this day been made holy. Okay. <laughs> The master of ceremonies then places the candidate between the two wardens with the draft before him. <clears throat> the senior warden says to him, examine with deliberation and attention everything which the all-pucent is going to show you. After a short pause, he, the senior warden, says, is there a mortal here worthy to open the book with the seven seals? Uh-oh, boy, check that out. All the brethren cast their eyes down and sigh. The senior warden, hearing their, their sighs, should, it says signs, it should be size. Says to them, Venerable and respectable brethren, be not afflicted. Here is a victim pointing to the candidate whose courage will give you content. Senior warden to the candidate, do you know the reason why the ancients have a long beard? Candidate says, I do not, but I presume you do. Here we go. Senior warden, they are those who came here after passing through great tribulation and having washed their robes in their own blood will you purchase your robes at so great a price candidate yes i am willing hello <laughs> how you doing uh so you would actually have a masonic ritual where the people have to pass through the great tribulation and that's what they're talking about you're going to see that so don't say, well, they just said pass through great tribulation. They're not, they don't really mean the great tribulation, like the posties all teach. Uh, no, actually, they do mean it. And in fact, they finish it at a very interesting time. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's keep reading. The wardens then conduct him to the basin and bear both his arms. They place a ligature on each, the same as in performing the operation of bloodletting. Each warden, being armed with a lancet, makes an incision in each of his arms, just deep enough to draw a drop of blood, which is wiped on a napkin and then shown to the brethren. The senior warden then says, See, my brethren, a man who has spilled his blood to acquire a knowledge of your mysteries, and shrunk not from the trial. Then the all-pucent uh, opens up or opens the first seal of the great book and takes from thence a bone quiver filled with arrows and a crown and gives them to one of the ancients and says to him, Depart and continue the quest. He opens the second seal and takes out a sword and gives it to the next aged and says, Go and destroy peace among the profane and wicked brethren, that they may never appear in our council. He opens the third seal and takes a balance and gives it to the next aged and says, Dispense rigid justice to the profane and wicked brethren. He opens the fourth seal and takes out a skull and gives it to the next aged and says, Go and endeavor to convince the wicked that death is the reward of their guilt. He opens the fifth seal and takes out a cloth stained with blood and gives it to the next aged and says, When is the time, or the time will arrive, that we shall revenge and punish the profane and wicked who have dest destroyed so many of their brethren by false accusations? He opens the sixth, sixth seal, and that moment the sun is darkened and the moon stained with blood. He opens the seventh seal and takes out incense, which he gives to a brother, and also a vase with seven trumpets, and gives one to each of the seven aged brethren. After this, the four old men, should say men, but it's a man, 
in the four corners show their inflated bladders, beeves bladders filled with wind under their arms. Um, representing the four winds when the all puissant says, Here is seen the fulfillment of a prophecy. Strike not, nor punish the profane and wicked of our order until I have selected the true and worthy masons. Then the four winds raise their bladders, and one of the trumpets sounds when the two wardens cover the candidate's arms and take from him his apron and jewels of the last degree. The second trumpet sounds when the junior warden gives the candidate the apron and jewel of this uh, degree. The third trumpet sounds when the senior warden gives him a long beard. The fourth trumpet sounds when the junior warden gives him a crown of gold. The fifth trumpet sounds and the senior warden gives him a girdle of gold. The sixth trumpet sounds and the junior warden gives him the sign, token, and words. The seventh trumpet sounds on which they all sound together when the senior warden conducts the candidate to the vacant canopy. You know, <coughs> um, and it goes down through there then, okay? Uh, and basically, the guy's done then. So in other words, he doesn't go through the vile judgments, which is interesting because that's what a lot of the uh, post-trib pre-wrath people teach. Some will argue over when, you know, all seven trumpets that the body of Christ goes through, for what reason, you know. But... <laughs> But they'll argue over that, or maybe you get out, you know, earlier in the trumpets or whatever else. But isn't it interesting that a Masonic degree, an initiation, is that you go through the Great Tribulation, and you look, you look at these uh, posty toasties, you look at their ministries, and they will all talk about, you know, oh, it's going to be hard, and and uh, you know, a lot of people, it's, it's going to be a real time of testing. So I have showed that the Vatican teaches it through the Catechism. It's in the Catechism about the Church's final time of purification. Right there. I've showed that thing on video numerous times. I'm not going to show it again. You can look up the other videos. Right there. That thing. The Catechism. The most modern. I, I don't know if they've updated it. That's a 2001 edition. I think it still is legitimate or whatever. The Catechism teaches it. <clears throat> a mystic nun, St. Catherine Ann Emmerich, uh, in... 1820 was teaching that the church goes through the Great Tribulation, and now you have a Masonic ritual teaching it. And you want me to believe that the people out there that are teaching this and militantly standing by it, you want me to believe that they're saved? It goes totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. That's why I wrote or did the other sermon the you know a long time ago, the false god of post-trib Christians. They do worship a false god, just as masonry worships a false god, just as Roman Catholicism worships a false god. They don't worship the God of the Bible. You see, as a Christian, the God that I worship, He sent His Son to pay the full price for my salvation. I don't need to do anything else to merit my salvation. I don't need to go into a time where I'm going to have to prove my truth and if I'm faithful and things like this, you know. I don't need to go into that time. I'm sealed until the day of redemption. I don't have to worry about taking some mark and losing my salvation and going to hell. And all posties do. All posties have to get to that point where they believe that. And you get these, you know, just ridiculous morons. That, oh, I believe in eternal security, that we're going to have the eternal security in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. You don't read much Bible, do you? Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11 makes it crystal clear that if any man worships the beast... And, and, you know, whosoever takes the, the mark and, and worships the image and things, there's three different things there. It's all part of the same system. If you do those things, you go to hell. If any man, any man, I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to go through and prove that I'm better and things like this and I've, I've gone through this great initiation and I don't need to prove that I'm a co-redeemer with Jesus Christ by, you know, Joining my sufferings to his, you know, and stuff like a Catholic thing. That's why I reject the post trib heresy, any version of post trib, pre wrath, post trib, the whole way through, whatever kind of stupid satanic heresy you want to come up with, you know, I reject it. It's satanic heresy. And you say, well, it's minor doctrine. Oh, it's major doctrine. It's very major doctrine. You see, if you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that He paid the full price for your sins, you're going to go to heaven when you die. All right? And I don't have to worry about it. My judgment's over. My judgment, Jesus Christ took on Himself on the cross. 
His righteousness was imputed to me. There's nothing else I can do. My life is a life of service to thank the Lord for what He did for me on the cross. I don't have to merit anything. All I have to do is just stay away from sin. Why? So I don't get punished. I'm a child of God now. I don't have to worry about, well, oh no, I, I, don't, I think I got out of it or something like this. I don't need to worry about that. All right? But if you're a postie, oh boy, if you're a postie and you're actually honest, most of them aren't. Most of them are, are filthy liars, just as plain and simple as that. They'll, they'll, oh, we don't believe that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. They lie to you right to your face. All posties that know what they're doing. I'm not talking somebody that's green, just got saved, they've been led astray by an Anders Snake film or Kent Helvind or anybody like that. No, no. I'm talking somebody that knows the arguments. They are a liar. And we know who the father of lies is. Right? But a postie has to lie about their positions. And in reality, in deep inside, they're going, I don't know if I'm saved. They can't really believe that they're saved. Why? What if the Antichrist shows up? What if I take the mark and stuff? I, you know, I, I'll lose it. I won't have it. And I mean, looking at the future and saying, yeah, you know, uh, God's judgment and wrath is coming down on this planet and I'm going into it. You're not saved. Simple. Don't let these uh, posties shake you up. Okay? So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.